speaker. Don't clap yet, because I have <laughs> second page. <page-up. laughs> um, so Jody Fatsky is originally from Winona. He's a chef and restaurateur in the Twin Cities. You may also recognize him from season 16 of the television show Top Chef. JD has contributed to multiple publications, including but not limited to J. Ryan Straddle, who's coming in June, Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club, and The Northern Soul Cookbook by Justin Sutherland. Before we welcome him, I wanted, I don't know if Jay is aware of this, but I guess he's friends with Mary Kay Felt or something. Yes. Mary Kay used to be the youth librarian here in the 80s for about 10 years and left to become the uh, director of the library in Owatonna. She sent a letter to the library. <laughs> Greeting friends. <laughs> Thank you for hosting chef, writer, and former library kid, J.D. Fratsky, at your speaker series. Um, she also sent us some money to buy you flowers and a gift. This is for you. I'm sending my niece, Hannah Walser. Is Hannah here? Hannah is here. To the event, as my personal representative, I'm sorry I cannot attend. J.D. was a regular and even staff from long ago and once upon a time, remember him with a huge smile. Certainly, that is how he remembers the public library. And then, word of wisdom from Mary Kay, make sure to tell him that if he brought his bike to the library, he should take it home with him. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in welcome to you. All right, y'all ready? All right, we're going to do one of these. All right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't even. I don't even really know where to get started. I can't. Uh, I can't begin to convey uh, the honor that this is. Um, I wouldn't be who I am without this building. Without this beautiful, beautiful building. Um, you know, the the idea that uh, you know was mentioned earlier. You know, do we even need libraries anymore? Are you kidding? I mean, this is, this is a beautiful, incredibly unique temple to the human imagination. Um, and I know that I certainly discovered and cultivated mine here um, with my cousin Keith when I was very young, um, starting out downstairs in the children's section. And then uh, we found out that all the, the really interesting and uh, quite frankly, a lot of times naughty stuff that we weren't supposed to be reading was up here. So. Uh, we acquainted ourselves pretty quickly with the frosted glass floors and the cast iron shelves and the spiral staircases and uh, you know when you're a kid you know everybody asks you those questions about um, you know the, the uh, you get the magic lamp and you get to rub it and you know what are your three wishes and um, I always said that my first wish would be a time machine um, and I got one um, this is one of the coolest places I've ever set foot in, in my entire life um, not that I've been a ton of places, but I owe a lot of who I am uh, to this building and the people like Mary Lou and Mary Kay uh, who took care of me while I was here and helped me find the things that I didn't know I was looking for. So, uh, I, so I just, let's start by giving a round of applause for the staff of the one out of the public library and the friends of the one out of the public library. I also want to give a very particular thank you to Kate for asking me in the first place if uh, I was interested in doing this tonight. So uh, Kate worked in one of the kitchens that uh, I was running up in St. Paul for a while. And uh, so she's part of the culinary scene here. She's a river kid um, and clearly uh, being a friend of the public library, uh, she loves the written word and all the magical things it can do. So um, I'm just, I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity. So. Um, uh, it was made very clear to me. I see a couple people under the age of 18 in the room. Um, uh, anybody under the age of 18 uh, from the East End? No? Okay. Um, there might be some F-bombs tonight. Just so you know. <laughs> hope, hope that's not going to scare anybody out of the room. Because I'm from the East Side and that's like using a comma. Uh, so, but uh, uh, I guess... Without further ado, we can, uh, we can get down to it. Um, you know, I was talking to my dear friend, uh, Danny Klecko, about putting together the, the set list for tonight. Um, you can't grow up in Winona and not love music, um, especially if you uh, had a skateboard as part of your life. So um, 
you know, there's a huge punk rock ethic in uh, some of the things that I did. So, you know, getting to play in a rock and roll band later on in life when I was up in the Twin Cities, uh, we did a lot of, you know, DIY, do-it-yourself approaches to things. So, uh, you know, putting together tonight's set list, you can see that there's a lot scratch scratched off and moved around. Um, but speaking of DIY, uh, not being a, not having a published volume of writing, um, I put some uh, dossiers together, I'm calling them, uh, in the next room. So they'll be available uh, on a DIY sales factor after the program is over. But um, I want to talk a lot about how great it is to grow up here um, and how tough it is to grow up here and how tough you can end up having to be uh, because of the environment that you're presented with uh, in this beautiful island city and the driftless bluff country. Um, yeah, so uh, my new job, I don't work day to day in restaurant kitchens anymore. I work for a company that helps people design kitchens and design menus and so I've been allowed to travel a lot because of that. And uh, a couple days ago I was in uh, was it, no, it was uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio. And uh, it was over the St. Patrick's Day weekend, so we went into a bar, a uh, bar and grill where like every, I mean, everybody's to the nines, right? And they got the beads, they've got the, the, the shiny green wigs on. I mean, it's nuts and the place is packed. And I couldn't believe they actually had a bathroom attendant in this place, in the men's room, a bathroom attendant in the men's room. And, uh, I get done with my business and I go to wash my hands and the bathroom attendant hands me a towel and I was like, hey, thank you, man. How are things going for you? He goes, I'm just trying to figure out this whole Jake Paul and Mike Tyson thing. What do you think about it? <laughs> and I'm like, this guy is going to make a ton of money tonight because he's got a question for everybody who walks into this <laughs> restroom. So, um, but uh, uh, I just really love the fact that he brought that up because we're going to start tonight with uh, a poem called uh, An Iron Mike Elegy. Uh, Mike Tyson was 14 years old when Ali got the beat down from Larry Holmes. The way Mike tells it, he let the goat know after the fight that everything he did moving forward was going to be a mission to crush Holmes and restore Ali's honor. Eight years later, 21 years old, seven inches shorter than Holmes, the Easton assassin, and undefeated, Mike crawled through the ropes in Atlantic City and took Ali's whisper in his ear. Get him for me. For four rounds, Tyson took it from Holmes because he knew how to take it until he decided he didn't want to anymore. Then he did what he went there to do. Each of us are brought into this world as harbingers of karma. I often strain to remember that in front of recipes and blank pages and innumerable obstacles that I'm gifted the opportunity to do for Joe Strummer, or Sam Cooke, or Carson McCullers, or John Radel, or Egon Sheila, or Anthony Burdain, what Iron Mike got to do for Ali. Uh, thanks. Uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, started getting in swimming pools again uh, as a way to, to exercise and move my body and kind of recenter on things. Um, I swam in, in junior high and high school. In fact, it was kind of funny. The, the kids' entrance, the children's section entrance over here uh, is where I would let my frozen hair thaw out after a seventh grade <laughs> swim practice while I waited for my dad or my mom to come and pick me up. Um, but uh, when I started swimming again a couple of years ago, it was really amazing how uh, that sort of became a time machine for me. That, that muscle memory of being in the water like immediately brought me back to uh, being a very young man. And it kind of helped me work through uh, a lot of the ways that I felt about myself at the time. Um, and, you know, as an adult, looking back at the child you were, um, you have to remember that, yeah, you've been this person the whole time, but you have become a different person who hopefully knows a little better. Um, and uh, so, it was kind of weird to, to be in that situation in the pool all the time and, and be transported back to these certain emotions and situations that I had. And uh, this was one of them. Uh, this is not a poem with apologies to Nikki Giovanni. Uh, we played water polo a few times a year. Uh, coach would surprise us, usually during the hardest part of the season, by ending the infinite laps a half an hour earlier than usual. 
Yanking out the nets from storage and into the deep end of the pool reminded me of sloppy seniors in letter jackets dragging a keg off the tailgate of a pickup. The captain would pick an opponent, and the two of them would pick teams. I don't recall us ever wearing headgear, and I'm not sure how we told our teammates apart. Perhaps that's, perhaps that's something about swimmers. We're expected to pay attention and just know. I was scrawny. The only things I, were better, I was better at than swimming were riding and skateboarding, and I wasn't a very good swimmer, so I wasn't chosen first or last. Everyone rotated in and out. Everyone played. The older guys were better and enormous, and I understood quickly that water polo and swimming was, that water polo and swimming was a team sport and a martial art, uh, and I didn't like that I, was, that I wasn't good at it. I liked even less that I wasn't expected to be. A lob came up and I caught it. I'd love to say that I looked for an open teammate with a longer arm like Maloney, uh, but I wanted to be a hero and I made for the goal. Two juniors leapt onto my head and shoulders, pretending not to rip off my goggles. I went under to their waists. I remember their hands and a knee in my jaw and how the water didn't seem to be cold anymore. It was only cool. The crack of the shouts and splashes melted and I checked in with the amount of air in my lungs. I gripped the ball tight mesmerized by the pull of the air trapped inside it. How I knew that if I let it loose from as deep as I was, that it would shoot out of the pool like a rocket, maybe even higher than the diving board. Bring this up, I thought. I will drown before I let them kill me. <laughs> Coach blew his whistle and ordered them to let me up for air. I surfaced with the ball. We continued the play. This is not a poem. This is where I started. Um, when I got the opportunity to uh, help drive some of the kitchens in the, the Twin Cities, um, it was really important to me to represent, you know, obviously the, my hometown, Winona, and the Driftless region, and the great access we have to sustainable agriculture here. And so when I got to be a chef at a restaurant in St. Paul, um, it was really important to me that we were constantly putting things on the menu where I could say, this is from Rushford, Minnesota, this is from Stockton, Minnesota, this is from, uh, um, from Elgin. You know, all these places that I was familiar with because we had gone deer hunting there, we had gone hiking there, you know, set a trap line there or something like that. Wood cutting, my dad when I was a kid. And so, you know, I just, where, where we live, where this library sits, this beautiful island in the Mississippi River, um, gave me so much that I wanted to give it to the rest of the world. So um, I've been very fortunate to work with farmers and chefs and, and other people in, in hospitality uh, to kind of let people taste where we all come from. Um, and so uh, this is called an unbroken sequence of gifts. Uh, I've never known a life that didn't have an immediate answer to where food comes from. Where I was raised, a car ride to dinner's provenance usually took less time than your average Lutheran church sermon. Uh, mud and river water and broken corn stalks, frayed barbed wire rusting on abandoned posts, cattails, acorns, plowed alfalfa, and stubborn random stands of soybeans still dangling in dried pods. I would later prepare them in my grown-up life as edamame and tofu, were all waypoints to harvesting life that trotted, sprouted, swam, or took to the skies. The older I get, the more I revere, to borrow a phrase from Paul Auster, the music of chance. The divine gambles on where we're born and the bodies we occupy. The people we're given in the forms of mother nature and human structure in which we're taught to find comfort or consider sacred. There are billions of bodies into which any of us could have been born. Countless other agonies or wonders that could have made up the routines of our daily lives. Eternity chose to put me in Minnesota this time around. By the choices I've made, it remains my home. I've learned to listen to its music and draw from the well of what Mother Nature offers here. I've also learned incalculable gratitude for a community that feels the same way I do a community inspired to nourish our friends and neighbors by reaching past what could be considered tradition and into older, deeper ways, to origins born of respect, perseverance, and generosity, three traits that serve, I believe, as the foundation for our survival as a species. I like to think that each of us reaches a point in our lives where we quietly 
and individually understand our obligations to disregard the status quo. I also believe that embracing the freedom to do so comes along with the realization that what's truly good for us, for our spiritual growth, nourishes those around us as well, and not in merely material ways. It is an exercise in gratitude that we awaken to and accept the responsibility that everything we've learned should be given away. What is life after all than an unbroken sequence of gifts? And we all know what's supposed to be done with gifts. Um, just by the numbers, uh, the person in this room who has given me more gifts in life uh, than anybody else is my dad, Dave. Uh, so he deserves a round of applause. He put up a new <laughs> This is called Three Crappies. You may bring me light if you wish. There are times that it takes my name away and I'm reminded of things like dry leaves and an ice fishing house after dark, my grandfather's match painting us blind for a moment, rousting us from the vespers of waving gales that I heard and didn't feel. I liked that flash, just the one that I remember, though knowing my grandpa had orbited into the shack every 12 to 20 minutes because it jolted me out of imagination and back to the planet I'd left. Back to January and four unheated walls of plywood, shingle, five gallon pails, line, bait, rods, waxies, dippers, my grandpa and my dad. Feeling larger in body, wider at the shoulders because I wasn't cold and whining to be brought home. I was calm and dreaming in the company of men Men who once in turn, then the other, made me flesh. Cool, like they were. I took stock in that. I thought about how much better it was for me to be a Frotsky than a Johnson, no, no offense, or a Chaplesky, uh, because of the way that I saw how deep the lines ran in Grandpa's face and how green, intent Dad's eyes sighed in the orange flash of that match on the caved end of a Pall Mall. Who knows where Dad was or where I was? All I know is that three generations of a long family had coffee, sandwiches, and hot chocolate enough to not give a shit whether our three crappies were worth the fact that I held my dad's hand when we plodded heads down back to the truck where I would fall asleep on grandpa's shoulder while we drove home. I wrote that poem in 1995, um, actually just a couple months before my grandpa died. Uh, that's, uh, that was, you know, talk about where you get started. That was one of the first poems I remember writing that I didn't try really hard to sound like somebody else because, you know, at the time, somebody, everybody else was way better than, <laughs> than I ever thought I would be. Uh, so that was one that I kept to myself for a long time. So thanks for letting me bring it out. Um, this is for uh, every Frotsky who ever grew up in the Driftless. It's called Top of the Draw. Every mind made up, branches knotted, a gauntlet of gnarls, heaps of withering tinder, brass acorns, monkey nuts, and yellow slug casings from last season. The hunch trot of anything that works the forest floor out of hunger. It's not enough to justify the cold. The alternative is the perverse, the perverse ease of concrete, the eternal horror of false promise. Gravel and mud are better prophets and are only too eager to remind you that a wrong step in reverie will dash your brains into Mother Nature's lap and the crows will laugh about it. But you manage to make it to your perch and climb spikes to the plywood, iron and chain your dad jammed into a maple. There's no dawn, just a slightly lighter gray. You wear the slush and shiver, desperate to truly be still. Your first real taste of the loneliness of survival is the recompense of life fading from the florid eyes of a bison once chased into this draw at the end of a spear. And for the first time, you understand your Remington as a candidate for rust. Uh, 
the first time I went deer hunting was out at, uh, was my dad took me out to Whitewater. I was 12, I think, 12 or 13. Um, and uh, it was just sleeting and snowing the whole hike out to the, the, the deer stand. And uh, that's before, <laughs> that's when layering still involved a whole lot of cotton. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so by the time I got there and got settled, <laughs> it was really, really cold, you know. So, uh, but, I, but I remember those days sitting in those tree stands, whether it was that year, the season after, the season after, um, is where you sort of first learn transcendental meditation uh, with, a, uh, with a high gauge firearm. Uh, but it, you know, your mind goes a lot of different places and it's the first time again, you know, bringing up the subject of time travel, you realize how long what we have has been here and what mother nature has done to it and what it's offering you now. And I love that about it. Um, I'm working on a project that uh, is gonna be a, kind of a sequence of vignettes with memoir sort of thing. Um, everything from my life here to my life in kitchens. Um, and uh, this will be one of the first vignettes. Uh, this is called The River. I'm six years old, squatting in the sand where an irregular tide washes over my toes. Driven by prop wash, barge wake, and an eternal current that I will learn to feel in my veins and take for granted as a part of me as natural as my breath or the soles of my feet. I'm scrawny. I weigh less than a golden retriever. Uh, <laughs> I don't yet have my summer haircut, so I wear a tousled bird's nest of the color of parched straw. I did have hair at one time. Um, in a few hours, my back and shoulders will be sun so sunburned that for the next four days and nights, even a breeze will feel like sandpaper. From the moment, though, I'm lost in a fascination, fascination with the liquid that will build my life. While I build a little world with, its, with a blue plastic bucket, army men, and my red and yellow tugboat, I can see the sand beneath the river stretch out from the light amber cooling my toes to the deep brown abyss past where I can touch, a drop off. Deep where I know that turtles and monsters and bullheads wait for boys who drown. I pull the river back, I pour the river back and forth between my boat and my bucket and I hold it higher and higher each time. It warms and brightens and I imagine it as melting sunlight. I raise my eyes to the bluffs and wonder if God made the river by dragging a giant stick through the sandstone soil and forests of Minnesota the same way I do now with the dark sand and seams of clay on this beach. A few days earlier, my dad had taken me and my little brother up to Garvin Heights in his truck. Dad was pointing where our house was and where St. Martin's was and where Grandma and Grandpa's house was when a red-tailed hawk flew right in front of us. It hovered and circled, and I could see its feathers shine in the sun. Being able to see the top of a hawk felt magic, and I was so happy that my dad took us to a place that made us feel like we were in the sky. When the hawk flew away, I looked over Winona and past the bridge, and I wondered if there were boys watching hawks with their dad in Wisconsin. I wondered if the river had ever been this high, like back in dinosaur times when everything was a jungle and Winona was underwater and the other shore was over there, far away in Wisconsin. I set up my army men and I looked again to where the river went dark. I wondered if I would ever be a dinosaur and if Winona would ever be like Egypt and King Tut's tomb or Atlantis. I didn't wonder though if the river would still be here. Of course it would. God had made it. It wasn't just for people, it was forever. So, um, mentioned St. Martin's, you know, I grew up in a, a Lutheran family, and when I was a young man, I, uh, I started to read some, some really beautiful books that uh, turned me on to the path of, of the Dharma, of, of Buddhism, and so that's kind of the way that I, I look at the world in eternity now. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is Stairway to Heaven in tonight's set, so strap yourselves in, kids. Um, <laughs> I will, I will perform the radio edit, so the guitar solo won't go so long. Uh, but uh, this is called the Upper Mississippi Flyway Book of the Dead. Um, and uh, uh, my cousin Keith will recognize some of this stuff in here. So 
Uh, there's a tradition in Theravada Buddhist practice, which some consider ghoulish, of seating oneself in meditation before a pile of real human bones as a way of confronting the transience of our time on Earth. It evolved as an endeavor to remain mindful of not only our personal impermanence, impermanence but the impermanence of all living things, thoughts, and actions. It brings to mind the mounds of flesh I've transformed into nourishment, if not outright transcendence, over the past 30 years of my time on Earth. I'll allow myself the universal sin of pride here, which is the cause of all suffering. Um, I usually began my days with butchery. After the doors were unlocked and the sickly fluorescent kitchen lights flickered on, after black plastic can liners were snapped open and tied to the skinny garbage cans we all know as Slim Jims, coffee was ground into a filter and brewed into an air pot. Lists were made, coffee was poured, my apron was donned and tied, phone calls were ignored, coffee was guzzled, two towels were tucked into the straps of my apron, the rest were quarter folded and to fluffy squares and stacked a foot high. A red plastic sanitizer bucket was filled. After my cutting board was arranged on the worktop cooler just so, I would select my music, North Country Blues, Trip Hop or Dub, maybe Getz or Dexter Gordon. I would then pile flesh in front of me and practice mindfulness. New York strips, or filet mignon from Primal Tenderloin, pork shoulders, venison saddles, halibut, whole salmon, boneless quail, tuna, tilefish, walleye, the grassy funk from legs of pastured lamb, opulent theatrics of grass-fed beef ribeye, carved two inches thick with the bone still attached like an edible Pleistocene shillelagh. Ducks were a wholly therapeutic focus, by far my favorite. Six to a case, two cases every other day, broken down with my grandmother's boning knife. What was once hers I now considered ours in an effort to carry her spirit with me. The blade sang its separations, wings first at the shoulder, then legs at the hip, then the luscious breasts and any of the fat left on the back and the sternum. Hearts and livers would go into a light salt brine and a, with a glug of Minnesota maple syrup. Later they would be rinsed and packed into pint deli containers to freeze so I could grind them into bolognese. The legs were Frenched, the practice of stripping a bone of flesh and fat, and trimmed, sprinkled with cotta pea spice, salt, sorry, in a classic French blend of white pepper, nutmeg, clove, and pulverized ginger. Fresh thyme, parsley stems, and laurel leaf to cure while we slept. Breasts were flipped skin side down on the cutting board. Their plump, brick red flesh bared to trim vein tissue and fat cap into a clean parallelogram not dissimilar from the shape of the state of Nebraska. Uh, then turned over and scored gently on bias with the sharpest part of the blade, a quarter inch apart, never all the way through. When the breasts were properly trimmed and scored, I would stack them up like ammo clips in a four inch deep number three pan of composite plastic or stainless steel. Fat and scraps went into a stock pot with two inches of water and a loose grip of dried pickling spices for a couple of hours to wet render on the back burner over, under very low heat. A wet render is when you take water and put it in the bottom of the pot and then put the fat on top so it has a barrier against the heat. And so as the fat renders, the water evaporates and then you're left with something that you can strain that is, a, a, I'll say, a, fat melts and begins to boil, it steams off the water and what's left is strained to transform into an aromatic roasted golden liquor uh, useful for everything from crisping fish skin to poaching carrots to drowning the aforementioned duck legs in a hot overnight low and slow confit. The fat is in effect waterfowl ghee, which is a toasted clarified butter. I would roast the wings, necks and bones in big pans with mirepoix vegetables and generous salt and pepper until the lot was milk chocolate brown carefully tipping the roast rendered duck fat from the roasting pan into the rendering pot was always an exercise in upper body strength and spatial awareness. <laughs> Deficiency in either department tended to start a grease fire or paint oneself or one's co-workers with a delicious and aromatic napalm, uh, <laughs> which is not conducive to a smooth dinner service, esprit de corps, or individual self-worth. Uh, I did all of this again and again, sometimes twice a week, sometimes four and even five days during our busiest winter months. 
And I never used that boning knife from my grandma's kitchen to separate meals from carcass without recalling a day that I hunted ducks with my dad. I had sailed a teal into cattails too thick for the dog to retrieve. Dad snatched my shotgun and pumped the action until it emptied. Yellow shells still weighted with steel shot thumping into the bottom of the boat and ordered me to push off into the reeds to find that fucking duck. <laughs> the lesson being that we were there to hunt, not just to shoot and kill, and I should never take the life of any creature I did not intend to eat. I never found the duck. Uh, so instead, I was made to clean the two mallards and the drake wood duck that my dad had called that morning. Maybe it was that lesson, or maybe it's my nature, but I've never laid a hand on flesh or taken a knife to a carcass without first thinking of it as my own. I marvel at the similarities in tissue and viscera, the coupling of joints and cartilage, fell and fascia, that transform cold, fresh death into celebration, solace, and nourishment. In Tibetan sky burial, the dead bodies of loved ones are carved into pieces and laid on mountainsides as an offering to ravenous carrion birds. Human bones are ground into dust and sifted into bread flour that makes a biscuit left on outdoor altars for rats and marmots. Tibet is a high, dry desert plateau. How efficient, with poor soil and unreliable rains, is it to transform death into life by nourishing it directly and with compassion, effort, and intent? I try to work and live and do my best by considering the inevitability of my spirit wriggling free of its carnal container. Were it legal where I breathe my last, I would prefer that anyone left to deal with my tattooed meat-covered meat skeleton <laughs> would leave it to ravens and coyotes to nourish them as I have been able with my meager hands and boning knife to feed legions of bodies and souls with the utmost best of my intentions. Mm. Too kind. Thank you. <clears throat> so, speaking of crows and ravens, um, I have a thing for them, and I, I think they're pretty remarkable creatures. And uh, so uh, this one kind of tells you why. Um, it's called Corvus Corax, uh, which is the, the Latin term for crows. Um, but in the Anishinaabe language, it's gagawi, which kind of sounds like a crow rocking out. And I love that. I love the uh, uh, onomatopoeia of a lot of the indigenous languages in the Driftless region. So uh, Corvus Corax. I love them because they are useful and they play. Common as they are, they are clearly clever and they give zero fucks about you or me or today's weather or their rate of pay. They do dirty work and they carry omens. They get mad cred for riding shotgun with Odin and keeping him up on all the down low. I consider them auspicious as eagles, even though they are everywhere, like shadows or my heart. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I was running a kitchen in St. Paul, and uh, uh, a hulking, handsome beast of a man uh, walked into the door and, and uh, into the kitchen and tried to sell me some bread. Uh, the company that I worked for already had a bakery, um, but uh, I also found out that this baker uh, wasn't just a baker, he was also a, a, a literary aficionado. Uh, a tremendous, really talented writer, um, and uh, probably one of Minnesota's greatest living raconteurs. Um, he's here with us this evening, Mr. Danny Klecko. Uh, he's written several volumes of poetry, um, not the least of which was uh, uh, Butcher, Baker, Hitman, Casket Maker, which won the Minnesota Book Award. But uh, we started a friendship that day that involved uh, me reading poetry inspired by Charles Bukowski at some of the readings that he did. Um, he has coached me and mentored me and, uh, and helped me out a lot. And uh, he's just been a great guy to, to talk to and hang out with. And uh, he really raises my spirit every time we spend time in the same room together. Um, one of the most amazing things about him, aside from the things he has done with baking, I mean, this guy baked bread for Mikhail Gorbachev, for God's sake, um, but uh, is 
uh, just the fact that he's a really, really generous spirit. Um, you know, it's, I've made no secret about the fact that, uh, you know, I've been trying to work through a lot of some mental health issues that I have. And part of that has been me just being very open about it and talking about it. And uh, Danny was one of the first people that I opened up to. We were sitting uh, in a tavern on Grand one night. Um, I think I was working on Irish whiskey and he was doing gin and tonics that night. But uh, um, I kind of let him know what was going on with me. And he said, hey, how about when you're there, all you have to do is send me a text message that just says struggling. And I'm probably not going to be able to do anything about it. But at least you're going to know that you can send a text message to somebody saying that you're struggling. And maybe that'll help. Um, and knowing that does. And you know, I'm glad that he's one of the people that I can send that text message to. The other really cool thing about Danny Klecko is uh, a couple of years ago, my mom and my sister and I uh, were going on a heritage tour to Ireland together. And the night before we got on the plane, Danny and I went and saw um, a really amazing movie called The North Man. Uh, and uh, afterwards, knowing that I have uh, you know, my Mississippi River blood, he took me out to his car and he gave me a copy of a book called River Man that I highly recommend you all read. Um, he said this is for the plane ride there and the plane ride back. And then he reached into his wallet and he gave me a hundred dollar bill and said, buy your mom and your sister around for me. So there is a distinct generosity of spirit that Klecko has always had. And he's one of the first person to come up to me, like pretty much grab me by the lapels and say, when are you going to write that book? I mean, for God's sake, like chef, skateboarder, punk rock guy, river guy from Winona, like everybody needs to hear about this. So one of the first poems, uh, Danny ever told me that, uh, that he liked that I had written uh, was part of a triptych about crows as well. Um, I've got a bunch of really cool lifelong friends in this room, so I spent a lot of time getting chased by the police through downtown Winona from uh, tonight. So this is for them too. This is, uh, this is figure two on a triptych that I wrote. Um, I've only been watching 15 minutes or so, but I'm positive that Raven was a skater. She doesn't kite like the others. That's carving. The way she stuck it on the maple branch was a dead giveaway, like she just popped up out of coping to end her run and give the younger rats a turn. She bellows in celebration at the others the way we used to over varials and finger flips or someone's first Ali Japan grab off the bank steps with that guttural squeal so exclusive to Corvus Corax. After a long few minutes, she drops in again and does that caballero hunch into the flat. She's just about to pump into transition when I lose her in a copse of spruce, like that secret chamber in the animal chin ramp. I wonder what it was, suicide, leukemia, drowning, or the bad luck of a car accident that ended what she was and brought her here. Not quite freed from gravity, but free from considering it a limitation. One of the other things I really like about being friends with Danny Klecko is that uh, he gets me in, in a lot of ways that other people don't. Um, and uh, he's the kind of person who uh, can read a poem like this and uh, know where it's coming from in more ways than one. Uh, this is called Soft Butter Bouchon. Sometime in the 18th century, common era, uh, Master Hakuin shared a meditation practice wherein young Zen monks, uh, pardon me, young Zen monks envision a duck egg shaped lump of butter placed atop one's head, slowly melting to become liquid, and gently cascade into all the functional recesses of one's nervous system circulatory system, and spiritual energy. I find this incredibly soothing, and I can't help but imagine the wood-fired kitchen of an aged French chateau, probably in the Ardèche or haute Zouan, where the melee of service prep is abruptly halted by a cast iron bell, a dozen young stagiaires and sauciers, two plongeurs, dishwashers, the pâtissier, pastry chef, a boucher, Guess what that is? And the sous chef, calmly and silently, and in the choreographed order of routine, set down their tools, untie and fold their aprons, 
and remove their toques. They form up in a single file and shuffle to a closet near the WC where they each grab a zafu, claim a spot facing the wall, and set themselves in lotus. Chef joins them and claps the chook pee. Everyone begins a slow, deep breathing into their hara, each of them contemplating that oblong orb of sweet cream butter running into their souls while they inhale the incense of potofu simmering over coals, cloves of garlic caramelizing in terracotta, and fresh baguettes cooling into their own state of grace. I really love that two centuries before the Gide Michelin began granting stars, Master Hakuin evoked enlightenment in a language any kitchen rat or dough slinger could hear as a hymn. Um, I find few things more therapeutic than uh, putting one foot in front of the other uh, in this neck of the woods. Um, this is called Not So Much in the River. Um, and uh, this is from my brother Ben. Last spring I hiked with Buddha on some trails off the middle branch of the Whitewater River. And I showed him a trout hole where my dad taught me to swim around the age of four by repeatedly dropping me in the cold current until I learned how to fly. Buddha waded in ankle deep, nodded approvingly, and I asked him how often he had been Ojibwe and Anishinaabe or Dakota. Whenever I needed to be, he muttered, without looking up from the hem of the robe he was trying to hold above his knees. He knew I had more questions, so he told me in my boots and the mushy cottonwood branch, and its rhyme of ice, and the pileated woodpecker, and two chickadees, you are not so much in the river as you are of it. I mentioned uh, the last name Johnson earlier. And that just kind of flew out of my head when I was writing that poem a long time ago. Um, I was friends with two brothers in high school. One was a couple of years older than me. One graduated the same year I did, uh, Hansi and Aaron Johnson. Uh, their mother, uh, Margaret, was a judge here in town for a long time, and they still live down by the lake. But uh, Hansi now works for the Minnesota Land Trust, and a couple of years ago we reconnected. Uh, became friends again, and he invited me to do a fishing trip up in the um, North Woods in uh, uh, Quetico, or not in Quetico, Quetico? Yeah, and uh, we had a brilliant time, and uh, I saw things on that trip that, you know, I've been up to the Boundary Waters many times, but this is the first time I had a really amazing experience with uh, uh, the Aurora Borealis. Um, so I wrote, uh, I ended up writing about that because, you know, you can't after you see something like that. Um, but it wasn't the first time I've seen them. So this is about my experience with Aurora Borealis. Uh, they were a murmur in the sky when I was a child. Swamp in my nostrils, half awake and gripping a shotgun longer than my brother, who I think was still at home in bed. Dad exhorted me to stand on the middle bench of the boat. Far across the river's dead rushes and muskrat houses, a glow pulsed above the black seam of the eastern bluffs. Those are the northern lights, J.D. I was 13 and barely cognizant, but I could tell from the tone in my father's voice that what appeared to me to be an elaborate plank, prank involving parking lot street lamps on the Scani side was instead a majesty I should remember. A lifetime later, filled by false starts of photographs, paintings, cartoons, and even a freak observance from the back seat of a Dodge on Riverside Avenue, uh, I watched them rise over border islands. Jade breakers rolled in front of the stars and shot lilac minarets into the dust of the Milky Way, growing, showing us more. River deltas and celestial jellyfish, fingertips, javelins, nebulous dandelions of dawn colors crawled over us in a tide of lights. Our great mother pressed her breath to my ear and whispered, that I was only watching the spirits of every beautiful thing that had ever lived swim in the sky as a way to give thanks to forever. 
I stood on the altar of earth and let my heart leave my mouth the way that wolves do. Now, I mentioned earlier, there's, there's something about living on the river that makes you love music. Um, I can't think of, I, I, you know, I've traveled to a bunch of cool places and I'm so fortunate to live in the Twin Cities now, but it's so odd to go to other metropolises or even like, you know, large, small cities in the country and realize that they don't have venues for live music and, you know, there aren't as many coffee shops where people can have an open mic night. Um, where are the record stores? You know, those kinds of things. So, you know, realizing how unique and wonderful that this beautiful place is um, and how much we love music and how much it's a huge part of our lives um, just makes me love where I came from even more. Uh, this is called River Language, and uh, this one's for Ann and Jamie. While liquids crawl from the heart of a log and crack without time, there's rhythm in the lungs of a fire. At some point, in hell-hearted hands, a guitar just plays itself. Howls rise above embers and sounds more like a tree in agony than foxes in heat or rain on thin steel. Rivers birth a certain cadence that loves to play on strings. They tend to call on spirits long-limbed and earth-colored that rise from seams of sand and clay and the roots at the foot of a bluff. They move dream slow with copper eyes, ravenous to devour hearts in sorrow. Almost there, folks. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for being patient. Um, this one is uh, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, this is called Mark Lanigan. Uh, Mark Lanigan was a, a singer for a band called The Screaming Trees back in the day, and he did a bunch of really amazing solo work. Uh, he released, I think, a dozen solo albums. Um, he was uh, an incredible poet, um, had one, one of the most unique and arresting voices that you've ever heard in rock and roll. Um, and uh, he, uh, he has pretty much stuck with me for 30 years uh, since I discovered his music as a teenager. And so uh, a couple of years ago, um, I remember you know, with the, instant, you know, the instantaneous news cycle that we have uh, reading that he died. Um, and it took, took it a while to sink in, but this is what came out of that. Uh, Mark Lanigan died today. There was a snowstorm here in Minnesota, all night and all day. After grocery shopping, while my wife showed an eager early married couple a home, I began with slaw and seared some beef and caramelized aromatics with dry spices, creating the edible incense of nourishment. Outside, our daughter is 17, shoveling snow onto the boulevard, wearing better gear than I ever did while doing the same. Uh, the heels of her hardy boots give her inches greater than biology, and she rests for a moment, tall as Norway pine, to catch her breath. Between the streetlight and her stillness and the dusty gloss of the snow, she leans on her shovel, silhouette of a statue commemorating a victory anywhere by Boudicca or Joan of Arc or P.J. Harvey. My daughter doesn't know that I've stopped to watch her or that the silver plume of her breath is the smoke of ghosts that failed. She doesn't know that Mark Lanigan died today at his home in Ireland, and that I'm listening to his songs while I sip red wine, okay, gulp red wine, <laughs> and prepare our dinner. She doesn't know about the galactic pulse I feel when it strikes me that everything about her is eternal and celestial and beautiful because she is her own. She doesn't hear the Mark Lanigan songs that used to perch on my shoulder with long claws and a dark weight, whispering in my ear to the audience of beasts and ghosts and filth inside me, the ones that dared my eyes to close. My daughter doesn't know that because she took to this earth, those whispers stayed a song, and legions of that unholy audience were never fed. My daughter, upright in the winter dark, scatters their corpses, starved and burned to ash in the snow she gives to February gales.
the grace of sensation. The grace of the way the river felt on every hungry pore of your body when the weather was too hot to sleep can create an ache you swear you could reach into the dark and touch. Contrary to accepted psychology, you can easily recall how much something hurt. You just keep forgetting how it's supposed to have changed you. You remember lips and slick skin, the sting of sleet, fists, an elbow that doesn't break your nose but makes it run and consumes you with the kind of rage that only lives in the fireworks behind your eyes. How about the soil in the joints of your fingers when Grandpa hands you his paring knife in the garden? The weight of a handwritten letter. Your palm on passenger window frost. That fit between bodies that both of you declare in warm breath and whispers. Music so loud your internal organs move. City rain, a dog's paw, ravens. The conclusion that you felt so much for so long that each moment is a fight for a first sensation. I really, really love that, you know, 200 days of the year, the river was part of my life in one way or another. Um, you know, we were either swimming in it or boating on it or hunting on it or fishing on it, uh, whether it was solid or liquid. Um, it really becomes you. I used to make the joke all the time that, you know, uh, I swallowed so much Mississippi River water that my daughter is probably part walleye. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and when we took her to swim lessons, that's what Lisa used to say, swim like a walleye. <laughs> um, but uh, it has everything to do with who I am. And I think it has a lot to do with who all of us are. Um, it carries communication and commerce and it carries music and it carries life in all sorts of forms. Um, and I think because of that, you can watch things move. And it gives you a perspective, I think, living, up in a, living in a river, growing up in a river, that you don't otherwise get elsewhere. Um, not saying it's better, even though I'm saying it's kind of better. Uh, and uh, I'm just incredibly grateful for it. And I'm incredibly grateful for the family that taught me how to love it, um, whether I wanted to love it at certain times or not. Um, and. Uh, I really think a lot of you feel that way too. I mean, you can't, you can't live here and not be affected by it the way that I feel like I have. And uh, it teaches you how to be tough. I mean, it teaches you how to conquer your fears. Um, you know, there's a, the guy who now runs Blado's Bakery lived on my block when I was growing up and his family had a boathouse in the river over on the other side of Latch. And uh, I mean, the, the, I mean, we were swimming in the river fuck, in April. <laughs> I mean, like, during, you know, when half of the rock piles over there underneath, you know, were completely covered by how high the water was, and we were swimming in there when I was like eight. Um, so, but you, you learn how to survive, and you learn that it's required of you to survive and do things that you might not want to do at the time, um, but end up being a big part of who you are and what you can handle and how you look at the world. And, uh, so this is this thick river, mother of heat, her furnace of breath, a blanket, and always there dark and treacherous sort of love. You only understand it when you give up your everything to it. There's a bliss in knowing that when you're ready, you'll end up where you're strong enough to make it to the shore. And if you can't, you'll die. Um, I'm going to leave you with uh, my favorite poem of all time uh, that has ever been written in any human language um, by a man named uh, Kobayashi Issa. Children imitating cormorants are better than cormorants. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Sir. The what, I'm sorry? The book gifting. Oh. The book gifting. Yes. Okay. okay. And then my other question is, think of it as broad as your mind will let you. Uh, I don't know how well I am at asking it, but uh, um, when I uh, think of menus and, and the like, and think of foods and menus and their earth basedness. I think of uh, plant based uh, food ingredients, every bit as earth based as, as, as any. And uh, I'm taken uh, that uh, your recipe uh, conversation and uh, speaking did not entail uh, plant-based uh, uh, recipes. Um, in this uh, era, the level of uh, food uh, uh, allergies uh, is every bit as uh, non-plant-based as, as plant-based, and uh, so that's where that that question comes from, and I, I, I bring it to you from that broad sense, and I'm, I'm curious to see what you would uh, want to say to it. Well, I think a, a, a lot of what I read tonight has to do with my experiences on the river hunting and fishing, you know, so of course those are, are living creatures, but again, you know, you know, my, one of, one of the things I loved most about growing up in the East End was, you know, I was six blocks away from my cousin's house. I was three blocks away from my grandma and grandpa's house. My grandma and grandpa had an enormous vegetable garden in back. And so, you know, that was snack time, was, you know, getting chased out of the garden, trying to eat kohlrabis slightly bigger than a golf ball, um, <laughs> you know, at the time by my grandpa. Um, so yeah, I mean, fresh vegetables were a huge part of the way that, that I grew up, and it was just a huge connection with food in the first place. And so, in fact, that was, that was one of the reasons that I really wanted to bring a lot of driftless region agriculture into restaurants in the Twin Cities when I was able to help make those decisions is because, you know, these 25 pound boxes of tomatoes that I would get in from a broadline supplier didn't taste anywhere near the tomatoes that my grandpa had grown in his garden did, you know. I mean, he would, he would squeeze the seeds out of his favorite tomatoes onto a screen and dry them out so he could use them for planting the next spring you know, in his, uh, in his hotbeds. Uh, so yeah, I mean, every, every bit as much of it. And I'm, you know, we, I mean, an, another thing too, like uh, uh, one of my dad's best friends lived in Rolling Stone. So every spring, every May, you know, we would go up into the, the bluffs outside of Rolling Stone. We'd literally come back with garbage bags full of morel mushrooms, you know, so that kind of foraging was done. But at the same time, like, you know, I'm 50 years old and I'm, I'm pretty sure that I can tell the difference between a chanterelle and, you know, that you can eat and another mushroom that'll kill you. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm jealous of people who have cultivated that skill and made a real passion of it um, and can guarantee that what they're taking out of the ground is, is going to be safe for somebody to eat. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite, like, internet memes ever is, uh, God, we gotta really give a lot of credit to the first humans who ever tried to eat mushrooms. I mean, think about it. There is that, you know, there's, this, this one tastes like steak. Uh, this one killed Brian immediately. And this one lets you see God for like six days. Um, I just, uh, it, I'm super overwhelmed with uh, the turnout tonight, especially the turnout for people that have been really close to me and my heart for a long time. So I can't thank you enough for being here. I can't thank you enough for the support you give the Winona Public Library. Um, 
let's keep making this a, a time machine and a place of transformation for lots and lots of people for the next 125 years. Oh, and one more thing. If anybody wants any uh, 1980s Ducks Unlimited memorabilia, whether it's prints, uh, wooden decoys, any of that kind of stuff, uh, we're going to talk to Dave Frotsky. <laughs> it's on the market. He's ready to get rid of it.